One of the unique challenges that a marketing researcher has to deal with when using secondary data is evaluating the quality of that secondary data. This is a necessary step for a researcher and one that's often overlooked by people without a research background. Without a research background, people find secondary data, treat it as true, and then move forward. A real marketing researcher doesn't have that luxury. We recognize that there's often limitations, or almost always limitations, to any study. So we need to identify those limitations and then make a decision whether or not we can use that secondary data for our purposes. There's five overall questions that we usually ask ourselves when evaluating secondary data to make a decision whether or not we can use it for our current research question. First, we need to evaluate what was the purpose of the original study, who collected that information, what particular information they collected, how they actually collected that information, and is that information from one particular secondary source consistent with other secondary data sources? While we ask these five questions, there's three buckets of answers that we may place in the answers to our questions. First, when we answer some of those features, we might realize they're positive features, enhancing the quality of the secondary data in our mind. Then we'll notice usually there are some negative aspects of that secondary data. And then finally, and most frustratingly, Many times, the necessary details that we want to know about how secondary data was generated are simply not available. So they're simply unknown features, and we have to make a judgment call about whether or not we can live with those uncertainties. What was the purpose of the original study? If the original study's purpose and our current research question and needs don't have a lot of overlap, the secondary data may not suit us as much as we would hope it would. On the other hand, if the original study's purpose and our needs are closely overlapped, that's usually a good sign that the secondary data will be relevant for us. The Bureau of Labor Statistics publishes annually an American Time Use Survey. The study does exactly what it says it does. It is a survey that provides a nationally representative sample of where, how, and with whom Americans are spending their time. One of the neat things about this data set is that it goes back to 2003, so we can observe changes in individuals' time, uh, use of their times. Using this survey data, let's take a look at two activities that we might think are associated with someone's overall state of happiness, the amount of sleep they're getting, and the amount of time that they're spending doing leisure and sports activities. These are two categories captured by the time use survey. The results here show from 2009 to 2019, the average number of daily hours spent by men and women engaging in these activities. What we see here is that both men and women are spending a little bit more time sleeping on the other hand, the amount of time spent on leisure and sports activities has remained relatively flat, if not declined a bit, for men and women. Based on these results, if we think that sleeping is tightly correlated with happiness, we might suspect that people are a bit happier. On the other hand, if leisure and sporting activities are associated with happiness, we might suspect that people aren't quite as happy as they were in 2009. However, the purpose of this study was to measure how people use their time, not to measure their state of happiness engaging in, the, in those uses of time. Therefore, this study might provide some helpful insight, but it's only tangential to the core research question we're investigating. According to the Gallup National Health and Well-Being Index, the percent of U.S. adults who identify themselves as thriving, per a scale that we'll explain later, has dropped to the same low levels that we saw during the Great Recession of 2008. For us to evaluate whether this change in well-being is useful for us to assess the change over time of happiness, we need to understand how the well-being measure was constructed. To measure this well-being, Gallup uses something called the Cantrell scale. It's a rather famous scale. Here's how it works. It presents respondents with a ladder and it asks them the following question. Assume that this ladder is a way to picture your life. At the top of the ladder represents the best possible life for you, and the bottom rung represents the worst possible life for you. Then respondents are asked to indicate where they see themselves on the ladder both now and in the next five years. How Gallup uses this scale is they say individuals who currently score themselves between 7 and 10 and imagine themselves to an 8 to a 10 in the next five years constitute the group that they call thriving. Now, what's clear about this scale is that it doesn't directly measure happiness either. However, 
unlike the time use survey that we referred to earlier, clearly, to the extent that happiness is part of people imagining a good possible life for themselves, this particular measure, which clearly includes some psychological components as well, is much closer to that core issue of happiness. As we're evaluating the source of the original research, there's two things that we're looking for. First, is there any evidence that that researcher may have had an agenda or a bias when conducting the research? Secondly, we're looking for evidence that the researcher actually has the requisite ex expertise necessary to properly conduct the research study. Here's an interesting study that illustrates why we should be suspicious when we have reason to believe that the people behind a study may actually have an agenda. This paper is called The Relationship Between Funding Source and Conclusion Among Nutrition-Related Scientific Articles. This comes from an academic journal called PLOS Medicine. You can access this study online for free. What they did was they found 72 published scientific studies about the nutritional value of beverages. Then they split those 72 studies into two different groups. First, they categorized studies that were funded actually by the beverage industry. Then they put the other group of studies as those who used other funding sources, such as academic grants. Then they analyzed the results of those studies and characterized them as whether the results are favorable to the beverage industry, neutral to the beverage industry, or unfavorable to the beverage industry. Now, if the funding source had absolutely no impact on the findings of a study, we would expect to see that these two stacked bar charts would be exactly the same. However, if you look on the left, you'll notice that if the beverage industry funded an article, a greater proportion of them were scored as favorable. Indeed, a larger proportion were also scored as neutral. Now, this doesn't inherently mean that a stud an academic study funded by the beverage industry is automatically biased. However, this does illustrate that source effects may impact the results of a particular secondary data study.